Many people wonder why there are four different Gospels, accounts of the life of Jesus while he walked on the earth. Have you ever wondered that? Why four? Well, uh, there could have only been one uh, extra long one that was very thorough, but each of the four Gospels tell a unique perspective of the same story. And they all claim that Jesus Christ is the Messiah who fulfills the uh, Hebrew Scriptures. And um, there's a theologian named Donald Stewart who puts it this way. He says, The Gospel of Matthew is primarily aimed at the Jew, the person familiar with the Old Testament. And Jesus is portrayed as Israel's Messiah, the King of the Jews. And Matthew records how uh, the promises God made in the Old Covenant with regards to the Messiah are fulfilled in Jesus. And Matthew begins his book by stating the family tree of Jesus. And uh, we see how he was born and uh, how uh, he is emphasized as the king. Now, the Gospel of Luke, on the other hand, was written to those who are more intellectually minded. Uh, Luke is not writing as an eyewitness, but as one who has recorded eyewitness testimonies. And his portrayal of Jesus is as the perfect man. That's the emphasis. And hence, he focuses on events in Jesus' life that stress his humanity. And the Greeks, in their art and literature, they were always looking for the perfect man. So the Gospel of Luke reveals that man. The Gospel of Luke emphasizes Jesus as the perfect man. The Gospel of John was an eyewitness account to the life of Jesus. And, um, you know, John 3.16 probably the most well-known verse in the Bible, springs from this. Um, The things he recorded were for the purpose of establishing the fact that Jesus Christ was the eternal God who became a man. And John wanted his readers to exercise faith towards Jesus. In John, Jesus emphasized was emphasized as being fully God in the flesh. Now, we come to the book of Mark. Mark, on the other hand, is not writing to the Jew or to those who are familiar with the Old Testament. His audience is basically those people in the Roman Empire who were unfamiliar with the religion of the Jews. And it's believed that, um, that through historical records in the second century that uh, Mark was specifically addressed to the Christians in Rome who were under persecution at the time from the Emperor Nero. And today, I would like to start a series in the book of Mark. Now, just as a background, I think it's helpful for us to understand the context of of anything that we study. And as a bit of a background to Mark, um, it was believed that Mark was written in AD 65, a year after the the big fire in Rome. Now, Rome was set on fire in... uh, in 64 AD, and um, Nero had started to go crazy, I guess, in about 59 AD, and uh, he set the, we we know that he set the fire to Rome, and 80% of the entire city in that fire was burned up, and being the man that he was, not of noble character by any means, he blamed the Christians for the fire, and after the fire, he had the soldiers of his army rounding up men, women, and children who professed to be Christians, and they were killed. They were killed as sport in the arenas. They were dipped alive in pitch and lit ablaze and hung on the walls of his garden to light his garden. The church at this time in Rome had to move underground into the catacombs. Just to stay alive. And the catacombs were a network of cave systems below the city of Rome that were used as grave burial places. So as such, Mark's gospel, which is the first gospel according to the history books to be written, does not start with the birth of Jesus Christ or a family tree that demonstrates Jesus as fulfillment of prophecy. It jumps directly into the life and work of Jesus Christ. And it starts with the beginning of Jesus' ministry as an encouragement to those believers who are facing extreme adversity. And Mark, in his his very concise book, he cuts to the chase. 
unlike sometimes your pastor, who can be a little bit long-winded. Mark cuts to the chase, highlighting the core of the works and teachings of Jesus. And as stated in the first verse of, of Mark, uh, Jesus is portrayed as the Son of God bringing the gospel. And um, he's portrayed as the servant of the Lord that's doing a job that God sent him to do. So the emphasis in Mark is on doing. And Mark shows that, that Jesus got the job done. So consequently, uh, Mark's gospel records actually more miracles um, of Jesus than to do Matthew, Luke, or John. And in Mark, Jesus is emphasized, and this is the emphasis, as the servant of humanity. Now, it, it's also helpful, I think, to understand not just the setting for this book being delivered, but also the person who wrote it. And in the book of Mark, it, it's undisputed, or it's, sorry, it's not disputed, I should say. It was written by a man who is known in the New Testament accounts as, as John Mark. And if you look at the, the New Testament, you remember the story of John Mark and how when Paul and Barnabas went on their first missionary journey, John Mark accompanied them, but sometime in the middle of their missionary endeavor, he turned back and went to Jerusalem. And uh, for reasons that are unknown to us, it doesn't really say, but he left this mission prematurely, and as a result, he fell out of favor with the Apostle Paul. And on the next missionary venture uh, with Paul and Barnabas that was going to take place, um, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them again. And Paul was like, uh-uh. He bowed out. He, he, uh, no, he's not coming with us. And there was a sharp disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas, you know, Paul was, was a Pharisee by training, right? Barnabas was known to be son of encouragement. So he had a little bit more slack for this John Mark fellow. And obviously he saw something in John Mark that, and Paul was like, no, I want faithfulness on my, uh, on my missionary endeavors. So John Mark ended up uh, going with Barnabas. Saul and, uh, Paul and Barnabas parted ways, and, and Paul went with Silas. And you know, God had that planned. They went in separate directions, but they were taken to different places, and the gospel was spread through both parties very effectively. So this is um, how it started with John Mark. But John Mark, uh, he, he, he proved himself. And, and later on, we see, actually in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, um, Paul says this. He says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. So after this um, parting of ways, John Mark and Barnabas you know, they had tremendous success in spreading the gospel, and, and Paul's heart softened, and, yeah, okay, well, I guess he is on the right track here, and, and yeah, and he welcomed him back. So today, I would like to start on this journey through Mark's gospel, and, and I, I'd like you to stop for a minute and just pause. I want you to imagine now, this isn't any kind of weird, new-agey thing, so don't worry about it, okay? I'm not, I'm not going to tell you to meditate on this, okay? I'm just saying, stop and imagine that you were a first-century Christian in Rome. You had just lost maybe your parents or your brother or your sister or someone that you loved who was burned alive or fed to the wild beasts. And you and the remaining portion of your family were driven underground in the city of Rome down into the catacombs. You know, we think we have it hard today. Imagine, if you would, that you were a first century believer below the city streets of Rome, sleeping in the Roman graveyard, probably next to skeletons, and you'd have to clear bones out. And you're always wandering around trying to keep yourself from being caught by the authorities because they're hunting for you and they're looking for you. So you can't make fires. Probably some of the food that you eat is raw. You have to 
You don't, you can't cook. You don't see the light of day. You're under in the catacombs. You don't come up. The only person that comes up is someone who smuggles in food and they, they risk their lives to get it. Sometimes they come back. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they get caught. The church in Rome was living in these conditions. Once the hammer dropped and Nero decided that it was fair game for Christians, these people were driven underground and they lived in caves. They had to watch how loud they talked and how loud they sang in different times. Never seeing the sunshine. Only a dark cave with an oil lamp or a candle. Put yourself in their position. Now, the book of Mark was written to encourage these believers about the faith that they possessed in Jesus, to take them back to the start and give them this account of the power of God and the, and the work of Jesus Christ as recorded by John Mark. So, Let's get into this. In the first chapter, in the first three verses, it is written, Mark chapter 1, 1 to 3. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Good news. So it starts off by saying this is the good news. The good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, has also been described in other places as the gospel. When we preach the gospel, we're preaching the good news. And it is good news. For a world that's lost and dying and doesn't know which way to go, Jesus Christ is presented as the Savior. And because Mark's purpose is to emphasize the servant role of Jesus Christ, he doesn't begin with this genealogy, the birth of Christ, but with the start of his public ministry, which started after his baptism by John the Baptist. Now, if you look into... Uh, into this, it's been said that there's more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament concerning the coming of the Messiah into the world. And of these prophetic predictions that were given throughout the Old Testament scriptures, two references stand out which indicate that a messenger would come ahead of the Messiah, calling the people to spiritually prepare themselves for his entrance into the world. And the first scripture is Malachi 3.1. And Malachi 3.1, it is written, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord who you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. And the second passage that deals with this is found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. Isaiah 40, 3 to 5, which says this. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So of these two prophetic passages concerning the appearance of the forerunner to the Messiah, the writer of Mark chooses the passage in Isaiah to open his dialogue concerning John the Baptist. And he uses, a, he uses it as a launching pad to give his account of the life and ministry of Jesus. So in verse 4, we see, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside 
and all of the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So John the Baptist is presented as this eccentric preacher living on grasshoppers and honey. Can you imagine that? It's, everyone else is in their homes, tucked away every night, and he's out in the desert foraging for his food, but every day he's going down to the Jordan River, and he's heralding the coming of a Messiah. And here it's revealed by John uh, Mark that John the Baptist was the very one that had been predicted by Malachi and Isaiah. He specifically mentions Isaiah's passage, and I find this a very interesting thing. Even today, before a person is ever ready to accept the seed of the gospel into their heart, the ground of that person's heart needs to be prepared ahead of it to receive the seed. And John came to prepare the ground for the teaching and ministry of Jesus telling the people that their hearts were sinful and they needed to be cleansed. And the people recognized this. And John the Baptist was a very popular guy at this period of time. The people were flocking to the River Jordan to be baptized by him because they saw their brokenness. They saw the brokenness of their land. And John came to prepare the ground for Jesus, telling the people that their hearts were sinful and they need to be cleansed by the living God. And today we look at water baptism as identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of the life of Jesus Christ, dying to our old nature and its desires and coming to new life in the Spirit, having been cleansed by the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. While this is true, The baptism John was giving was serving a different purpose. You see, the Jews for centuries uh, before the coming of Jesus under the law of Moses, they had been encouraged to be ceremonially cleansed before coming into the temple. It was a ceremony of of them acknowledging that they were they're sinful and they were dirty, not just on the outside, but on the inside. So there were ceremonial baths. If you go into Israel today and the different ruins that are there, there was often places where people would go for ceremonially cleansing themselves. They'd go down a staircase and they'd have a special place where they would cleanse themselves before they came into the temple. It was part of the law of Moses to do this. And um, so this different purpose that John, John was preaching a baptism of repentance. He was preaching uh, a message saying, your hearts are unclean, people. You need to rend your hearts and not your garments. Rend yourself before God and submit to him. And and he had a purpose in not only baptizing them, but telling them that there was someone that was coming that, that would be greater than he was. He made it very clear that he was not the Messiah. Now, just to emphasize what I was saying here about cleansing, you guys ever heard of, uh, um, there's, there's different Hebrew writings. And, and one of the, the Hebrew white writings called the Babylonian Talmud okay, was where the Jews got all their, their laws and, and, and how they used that kind of as a reference manual for how they would uh, go and, uh, and fulfill the laws. And, 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 you know, along with, circumcision and, and sacrificial offering, uh, baptism was required for, uh, to, to prepare the heart. This is all part of their, of, their, um, of their teachings. And these people, they came from all over the place. As we see here, they came from uh, the whole Judean countryside and, and, and all the people of Jerusalem. That's a lot of people. They're flooding there. The Pharisees and the scribes, and they're trying to figure out who this guy is, right? So they're all watching and everything. And, uh, you know, back then, 
as it's true today. Um, before a person can come to believe in the true Messiah, you've got to understand that you, you're broken, that you're a sinner. You know, this world today, a lot of people don't understand this. And they need to be told, this is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is to reveal to people the brokenness of the state of their being. Everyone intrinsically knows that they're, they're sinners, but people like to push that away. I'm a good person. Nobody wants to be known as a person that's bad, right? So they try to, you know, do the good things. And some, some don't. Some just like, oh, forget it. I can't be good, so I'm just going to be hell on wheels and just go do whatever I want to do and hurt whoever I want to hurt, steal from whoever I want to steal, kill whoever I want to kill who gets in my way, as we've seen here this week in our little town. Right? But before a person can come to believe in a Messiah, a Savior, they have to be aware, made aware of the fact that they need salvation. And this was the primary purpose of John the Baptizer's ministry. So he, he was telling the people to repent, to be broken before the living God. Like ground in the field, the human heart has that, needs that plowing and that cultivating you could say John the baptism, baptizer was God's cultivator who came ahead of Jesus. And he would sow the awareness, Jesus would come after him and would sow the awareness of the truth of God into the hearts of the people, which would then sprout and grow into spiritual life and in the end produce a harvest of righteousness, right? John was the one that was there with the plow, plowing it ahead. And they, in verse 7, he says this, he says, and this was his message. This is the message, the core message of John the Baptist. After me comes the one who is more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, for us Westerners, this is a little bit of a strange, ref, a strange scripture. You know, we can kind of picture it, you know, because we knew all the people back in the Middle East at that time in the desert regions were wearing sandals. So we, we kind of get the whole humble thing with the servant who would, uh, who would bend down and, and uh, untie his master's sandals. But uh, you see, unknown to us, but very well known to the religious people of that day, John uses a word play here to speak to the Jews. Now, I was telling you about the Babylonian Talmud. There's this section of the Babylonian Tal Talmud called Reboth 96a. That's kind of like a chapter in the Babylonian Talmud. And, and this is what it says. It says, All services which a slave does for his master, a pupil should do for his teacher with the exception of undoing his shoes. There's a reason why foot washing was such an act of humility. Because pupils would never undo their master's, their, their, their schoolmaster's shoes. If you're a pupil of a rabbi, you would never undo his shoes. They wouldn't make you stoop to that level. You see, that was, that was assigned to a slave. Now, in those days, there were slaves. There were servants. That duty was assigned to a slave. He, the slave, or she, the slave, would wash their master's feet and untie their sandals when they came into their dwelling. That was the duty of a slave. So do you understand what John is saying? He's saying this to all these people all these religious leaders, all these people there that were coming to, to be baptized. And he's saying, I'm asking you to rend your hearts before God. Repent. Prepare the way for the Lord, for there is one who is coming who I am not even worthy to untie his sandals. In other words, what he is saying is, this person that comes on my, on my path that I'm preparing for him on, that person, I am not even worthy to untie his sandals. 
He's saying that in comparison to him, he is less than a servant, less than a slave. Because he's not even worthy to untie and help this master with his sandals. Wow. Do you get the profoundness of this? In our Western minds, we kind of, the punch is kind of lost, right? But in that mind, he's saying, I, the baptism I'm offering here is just a water baptism, people. But this one who I, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals, he's not going to baptize you with water. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And this is profound because nobody can baptize someone in God's Holy Spirit except for God himself. You can't baptize someone in the Holy Spirit. I can't baptize someone in the Holy Spirit. No human being outside of God himself in the flesh can baptize a person in the Holy Spirit. What John was doing, he was telling them that he was preparing the way for God in the flesh to come to them. The Messiah would be fully a human being, but he would also be fully God. He would be Emmanuel, God with us. The Messiah would be coming into the world to save their people from their sins, save his people from their sins, and baptize them with the Holy Spirit once they had been washed clean on the inside. For God cannot fill an unclean vessel because there is no darkness in him. There is no shadow of turning with him. Where God is, darkness is not. Do you recognize the meaning of this? The implication is, my friends, is believers in Jesus Christ Today, if you believe in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is applied to the doorposts of your heart, you are clean. You are clean because God cannot live in a vessel that is not. And this is why it is written, for by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You can't do a single thing to earn favor with God to make him accept you and move into your heart and the Holy Spirit. You can't. It's the sacrificial blood of the Messiah, the Savior who coming into the world, who's jo who John is heralding here. So at that time in verse 9, Mark 1 verse 9, reading on to verse 11, at that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw a heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Wow, can you imagine, imagine being on the riverbank that day? Can you imagine the blessing of being able to see the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, the one whom John had told you he can't even, he's not even worthy to undo the sandals of coming down. And this is the one. And as he goes under, and as he comes up, heaven is torn asunder, and the Spirit descends upon him like a dove. <laughs> God chose this as a sign. And blessed are those witnesses who saw it. It's the very start of the ministry of Jesus. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. It doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit was a dove, but it appeared like a dove coming down on him. And as this was happening, at the same time, God the Father spoke to all who were present, saying, concerning the Son, You are my Son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Wow. What a powerful spectacle that God gave in this place. As Jesus was coming out of the water, it represented to the people that the ministry of Jesus was clean and that it was blessed by the Heavenly Father God. God's signature was all over this. His salvation plan for the world was being unfolded. And it was going to be unfolded through this Messiah 
who would conduct his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, being that Jesus would be ministering to people who were bound by the power of darkness, prior to his ministry among them, it was very important that the Son of God, the Son of Man, that he would identify with them, yet remain clean. So after this baptism takes place, it says that Jesus was sent out by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. It says in verse 12, At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was out in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended to him. Now, to many people, the the gospel accounts of Jesus being led out into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan is baffling. Have you ever been baffled by that? I I mean, uh, along the way in my Christian life, I've kind of, hmm, how can God be tempted by Satan? What's going on here, right? Maybe you've had that question too. But the ministry of Jesus, you see, when he came as a servant of humanity, it had to involve him being fully man. Philippians chapter 2, 3 to 8, tells us about the state that Jesus placed himself in to save humanity. For it is written, and this is in context to us imitating Christ in our attitude, but nevertheless, it tells us about what Jesus did in becoming a human being and being born as a human. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in, a, in appearance as a man, he humbled himself upon, or by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Powerful scripture. And it goes on to explain that he was exalted. But Jesus came... He came in part, and this was his mission, right? To be the Savior, to be the sin bearer, to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world, the perfect sacrifice that would end all sacrifices. He came to be the sacrifice, but he also came to be the high priest of mankind. And a high priest is one who represents man before God. And Jesus came to identify with the human fully, so he could represent them fully. Now, don't don't mistake what I'm saying here. At no point did Jesus ever lay down his nature as the Son of God. He was always the Son of God from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. (laughs) But what he did, he chose to lay aside the advantages of his own deity as God the Son, the advantages of that. And the Son of God instead chose to move in the power of the Holy Spirit in the same manner that those who would follow him after his resurrection would follow him. Only he did it perfectly. The difference is that Jesus walked in perfect alignment with the Holy Spirit. You know, the scripture that says, um, keep in step or walk, in the Holy Spirit, walk, with the Holy, walk in the Holy Spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You will not fulfill the desires of the sinful nature if you walk in alignment with the Holy Spirit. Jesus walked perfectly in alignment with the Holy Spirit from the time he was born to the time he was resurrected and still today. He walked in perfect alignment, in perfect harmony. God is one. There is no differences. They don't have arguments between them, the, the Godhead does not, they always think it as one. Okay? They still have the same mind. The difference with, with this here is we see Jesus identified with sinners 
in his baptism, but also in his temptations. For him to be fully man, he had to face temptations just like any other man faces temptation. It's written in Hebrews chapter 4, actually, Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. There's a commentator named David Guzik who says this. 40. Hmm. Jesus was out there for 40 days, right? Being tempted in the wilderness. 40 is in the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness. It's a number that often shows the, the time of testing or judgment. In Noah's flood, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses kept sheep in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus was tempted in the desert for 40 days. This is Jesus' time of testing. And during that time, Mark mentions that Jesus was with the wild beasts. And there's also a sense that uh, the angels were ministering to him at the end of this time of intense um, temptation as well. And despite Jesus subjecting himself to human flesh and allowing himself to feel the temptation. Okay? This is what Philippians 2 is talking about. Right? Despite that, despite the devil's onslaught of attacks on him, Jesus Christ shows his authority as Lord and God over all of creation, right? Not only over the wild beasts, but also over angels. They're all his servants, so we see a glimpse, again, of his divinity even though he is clothed in flesh and is fully man. We need to grasp this and we need to know how to explain this. Your God, Jesus Christ our Lord, is not part man and fully God and not part God and fully man. He is fully man and fully God yet without the fallen nature of Adam. He's a man. He's the second Adam. The second Adam undid what the first Adam done. The second Adam was the good news. You see, this is good news that, you know, although people are bound in chains of darkness, they, they don't know their right hand from their left. They, they continue to, to drudge around in the darkness. There is a light that shines brightly on the horizon. And if they will only look towards that light and and say, I'm a sinner. God will shine his light into their hearts. You are ambassadors of that light. Hillside Community Church and other believers in this community, we are a light on a hill that cannot be hidden. Therefore, let your light shine before men that they might see your good works. Notice that. Okay? Not just see your gatherings and the, the bickering that you do on Facebook. No. That is an antithesis of what God's intention is. Let them see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what it's all about. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Jesus has called you. He's commissioned you. John spoke of it. He said, this is the good news. You are receptors of the life of God that is in you. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he's also given you another comforter to comfort you when you're, you're never walking alone out there. It's dark out there. It's tough out there. Sometimes it's hard. In the catacombs, it was really tough. Can you imagine with your little children having to run around in caves of darkness, and that's their childhood, and you're there for years. You're not just there for a couple of days. You're down there until who knows when. There's no... This is actually where infant baptism came from. That's where it came from. The parents were so afraid that their children were going to not make it the next day, they sprinkled them when they were born because they didn't know if they'd make it to the next day. They wanted to dedicate. It was actually a baby dedication is what it was. You know how we dedicate babies? That's where that tradition came from when the Christians were hiding underground and they didn't have access to water. They just had sprinkling. And they wanted to do what they, they had. They wanted to give what they had to the Lord and honor the Lord with what they had. That's how that started. And then it became a, a tradition of 
of the church where they, they made it a right. You know, and that's not correct, right? It's not correct. But their hearts of the early church were right when they did this. They wanted to dedicate, they wanted to say, Lord, take my children. If it's time for us to die, I want my little one to be dedicated to you. That's what they were doing. So, Jesus' mission was to do the will of the Father and to identify with sinful man without sin. And Jesus went through the pain of this temptation in the wilderness to express his solidarity with fallen man. And Mark testifies that he overcame without faltering. After, verse 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. So John was put into prison. Just as the other true prophets of God through the centuries before him, men had been put in prison and put to death. John was put in prison. And eventually, we know the story. He was, he was beheaded by, by Herod. He was mistreated and they attempted to silence him. But, but you see, God had fulfilled John's mission to prepare the way for the Lord. And God kept his servant safe until the mission had been completed. And then he took him home. You know what that means for you? And I've said this before. You have a mission from God. Yes, you. You have a mission from God. And you're not going anywhere until that mission's done. You're not going to go anywhere until your mission's done. Pray that the Lord would help you to see the mission where you're at. Is it your neighbors? Is it your friends? Is it, is it a relative? Or is it a brother and sister in your congregation that you can encourage, that you can strengthen? We strengthen and build up one another and prepare one another to take the gospel out there. Is it something, is it, is it, is it supporting our local camp ministry, which is an important arm of the church? It might be that and more. Maybe God's calling you to give your life in service to him overseas. We joked about it in Bible study. You know, there's this old Scott Wesley Brown, I think his name was, song. It says, please don't send me to Africa. I don't think I've got what it takes. I am a man. I am not a Tarzan. I don't like lions, gorillas, or snakes. Please keep me safe in suburbia in my comfortable middle-class life. Please don't send me to the ends of the earth where the natives are restless at night. We were joking about it. But it's true. Are you willing to lay down your life for the gospel? Are you willing to give everything that God has given to you back and say, Lord, is yours. You know, the scriptures tell us that our life is not our own. We are bought with a price. We are purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. You are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. And everything you do, that means your hands. It means your feet. That means your mouth. That means everything. That means your car, your home. Everything belongs to him. And we give him free access to that as believers. and Say, do what you want, Lord. I go where you want me to go. You can't outgive the Lord. You give God everything that you are and everything that you have, and he will return to you sevenfold of his, of his presence and, and, and his blessings. Now, I'm not talking about mansions and money and all that stuff. Now, that's not what... You know, those who want to get rich fall into a trap and pierce themselves with many griefs. That's not godliness is, is, is contentment, but also godliness is following God in the mission that he's given you to do and to be. And maybe you're called to be here in 100 Mile House like we are right now. You know what? It's a good place to be. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for putting us in 100 Mile House. Thank you for putting me in the neighborhood that I live in because those people around me need to know Jesus. Thank you for giving me the job that I've got because I'm a light in the darkness in the midst of that. And maybe I don't like it sometimes. Maybe I don't like it. Maybe I'm a mother. God put me in this place so that I could, I could pour into the life of my children so that there would be godliness in this world. That's a noble calling. God puts us in different places. Maybe I'm a prayer warrior. 
I can hardly walk anymore because of my physical ailments, but I'm a prayer. God's given me the knowledge and the wisdom from years of experience. I've, I've failed and I've fallen and I've been broken and beaten up. And Lord, help me to learn from that and help me to pray for others. Maybe it's ministry of encouragement. All these things are God's and they're given to us to give back to him. Why? Because that's his purpose. He wants you and I to be participators with him in the divine nature. He wants us to to allow the Holy Spirit to take what he's given to us and give it away. And he will do the work as we are faithful in distribution of what he's given us. You want to see 100 mile one to Christ? Amen. I want to see it. That's the desire. We should be praying for it and asking God, give us ideas, give us thoughts on how we can reach the people around us, how we can show them the love of Jesus Christ. You know, we like to come to church. We like to come to church. That's the wrong idea. We don't come to church, people. We are the church. And the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ because he is alive. He is the risen one. He is the Savior. And John the baptizer heralded this. And you're the inheritors of it. I'm saying this to myself as much as I am to anyone else. If you can imagine the joy of the first believers when they are able to read this first gospel. They're probably huddled around in family groups, moms and dads and children huddled around, and those who could read would be sitting there under the lamp reading these words of hope that were given by God himself through his servant John Mark through, you know, as, they were, as he was led by the Holy Spirit to do. They didn't have to fear anything. They didn't have to fear the catacombs. They didn't have to fear being strung up on the walls of Rome or be fed to wild beasts or anything like that because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world because their God, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, the son of David, the son of God, he was with them and he would be with them to the very end of the age and the book of Mark is given to these people as a, beacon of hope to encourage them and to strengthen them and to be material for them to share the good news with the people that they encountered wherever they were. And it might cost them their lives. It very well could. But they had peace in their hearts. Nothing could separate them from the love of Christ. (sighs) Even in the midst of the catacombs, joy peace and love and comfort from the Holy Spirit. I trust that you are well understanding what I'm saying here. Because the same comfort that was given to the early church in the catacombs is the comfort that Jesus gives you today, right where you are. Because he knew that you would be where you are. And we're all here today because God chose us to be here. And the provisions that he's given to the church and the catacombs is the same provision that he gives us. It's the same God, the same spirit that we partake in. Jesus did it all for us. Now, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never actually submitted the lordship of your heart to him today. Heart being your spirit. So you're a soul, a mind, will, and emotions. You're a body and you're a spirit. If you've never submitted your spirit to the Lordship of Christ, now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. Submit your life to him. Give your life to the master. And he will give you his strength to endure whatever comes your way. No matter what. Because there's eternal life that comes after this world. So it doesn't matter what happens here. God is taking us through this. And he's got a place of an unimaginable beauty in store for us. I go to prepare a place for you, said Jesus, right? That when I come again, I'll receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's the hope of the church, the people of God. You can become part of the church. You can become part of God's family today. You just have to acknowledge the fact that you can't do it all on your own. You're a sinner, and you need salvation 
And one who has given his life for you is God in the flesh. He loved you so much that he, he gave, his, gave himself to us. That whoever believes in the Son of God, Jesus, being this God, God the Son, should not perish but have everlasting life. And the Son of God didn't come in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. You can be saved today. If you're listening online out there, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess him with your mouth and come to him and be saved today. And if you've made that decision, don't put it off. Do it now. You need to talk to someone who knows Jesus and start this journey together with the people of God, the church. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we come to you and we thank you that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you are God on the flesh, that you came to redeem what was lost and bring it back home to yourself, Lord. God, our hearts without you are darkened and lost. But for those of us who believe, God, we thank you for your salvation. We thank you for sending John the Baptist ahead of you, Lord, to prepare the way. And we thank you for coming into the world. And as we study the book of Mark, God, we pray that our hearts would be turned towards you. It'd be, they'd be encouraged, that we'd be strengthened, that we'd grow. For those that are out there this, this morning that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, God, I just pray that you would just cut them to the heart right now and that they would see your great love for them and that you invite them to be your children. So Lord, today, we just pray that you would you would just do your work, Lord, as only you can do. And God, as we go our separate ways from this place, there is none like you, Lord. No one else that could touch our hearts the way that you do. God, there is none like you. Would you stand with me today, in Jesus' name, as we close this service off?